This podcast is brought to you in part by Bogart Extractors, an industry leader in hydrocarbon extraction. Bogart machines have been used in licensed extraction facilities all over the world and are available in small or large capacities for any scale operation. Get the right equipment for your lab today by calling Bogart at 855-553-3887 or visit them at bogart.com. That's B-H-O-G-A-R-T dot com. Welcome. You're listening to Casually Baked, the podcast. Home base for the can of curious. Thanks for tuning in. It's high time. We had a high time. Together. Together. Yes, it's high time. We had a high time. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe your host and Cannabis Lifestyle Guide. Before I kick off today's show, I want to rave about you. Thank you for being canna curious enough to hit play on this highly responsible cannabis content. If you like what you hear or you learn something valuable from today's chat, I hope you'll be inspired to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. That one small action helps other canna curious folks Find our tribe. So thanks in advance for doing your part to Puff Puff Pass It On. Today, I'm happy to pass on to you this chat with Sarah Gullickson, an entrepreneur, cannabis CEO, and mother of two young children. Sarah funded her first venture at 27 and later sold her brand portfolio, including a cannabis tech platform, to a publicly traded company for $10 million. A year later, in 2019, she would sell two other businesses for a $5 million valuation. Gullickson has consulted on an international scale in Canada, New Zealand, and Europe. She is also a multi-state cannabis license holder with six licenses that are minority or women-owned. Sarah offers a dynamic perspective on the cannabis industry, and we discuss her journey of navigating the nascent industry without a playbook. We explore different state models, licensing fees, and some of the hurdles of creating a stable cannabis industry. If you're ready to jump into cannabis and can't decide which lane makes the most sense, there's something in this podcast for you. And ladies, if you're looking for some inspiration to find your seat at the table, whether in the cannabis industry or beyond, this podcast is for you too. But it's also for anyone curious for a behind-the-scenes look at the business of cannabis. So smoke them if you got them and settle in. It's time to get casually baked. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show. Lifting Co. Expo is coming to Metro Toronto Convention Center this May 12th through 15th. Level up your industry intel at the Lyft Cannabis Business Conference and connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from over 250 exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lyft Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Who doesn't love more? Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. Is high time. We had a high time together. Together. I'd like to welcome Sarah Gullickson to the podcast. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yes. You know, I learned about you and what you're doing with the cannabis business advisors, and you're just one of those doer types of women who's just getting out there and making it happen. And so I wanted to showcase you and your voice and the things that you've learned because you've been in the cannabis industry for 13 years. I was lucky enough to get into the cannabis industry, you know, in the very early stages. And um, by the grace of God, I've I've stuck in it. (laughs) That's tough to do because so many of us, I've been in the industry since 2015, And, you know, you got to stop and take a knee every now and again. Like, it is rough in here. 
Oh, yeah. I, in my earlier years in the industry, probably because I wasn't as business savvy or maybe even mentally equipped. I mean, there was definitely a point where I had to be like, okay, I'm stopping everything. I'm turning to yoga. I got my yoga teacher certification and just going through the course, it was enough to like get me back on track. Um, but I've definitely had certain periods in you know the last 13 years that I've had to put a hard pause on things just to get some mental clarity and, and get some strength to go on because um, it can get very defeating. Yes. I would say that you starting out 13 years ago, you were one of those folks who were navigating the business side of cannabis with no playbook. And I, so I'd like that to kind of be our guide through our conversation today so that you can share with us what are some of those learnings that you had? What are some of those critical forks in the road that you came to? Yeah. So, you know, dive in wherever you feel inspired. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I've done a lot of different uh, media around this. Um, and my, my message has changed immensely since becoming a mother in the last couple of years. And since, you know, taking one of those pauses for maternity, um, I had stepped down, uh, as the CEO of a publicly traded cannabis company. And, um, you know, I think my heart has always been in the right place in cannabis in the sense that that's kind of what my guide was, is that I wanted to, you know, get access to medicine for people. And I really felt like I was doing the right thing. And so with that, for me, a lot of creativity takes place where I have to be in some sort of an atmosphere where I can freestyle a little bit. So at certain points of my career, if things got too stuffy or too corporate, I noticed for myself, I couldn't function like I used to. So that's been probably one of my like key findings um, in my later career in the industry. And two years ago or three years ago now, when I was, you know, going to either stay on maternity leave or potentially do something else, um, one trend that always came up for me was my my love for the industry. And I just really felt like a calling for the industry since a very early age when I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I got bruised up a lot more back then because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but again, I always felt like this calling to be in the industry and help shape the industry. And my number one thing was I wanted my kids to read about me, you know, in some sort of like history book or media piece or whatever that was. So obviously I'm, you know, beyond that. Let Go me ahead. pause you real quick, because mm -hmm. for you to have that kind of a drive to, you know, be someone who's building this nascent industry, what is your relationship with cannabis personally that brought that to such a big place in your life? So my sister had a very rare blood disorder when we were younger growing up. And so my mom at that time, you know, this is like 30 years ago, turned to naturopathic medicine, which back then, especially in the Midwest, it wasn't really like a thing. So my mom didn't like what traditional medicine was going to do to my sister's body at a very young age. And so she started to like read up and research. So our household was very like naturopathic. We had, you know, organic, clean products. You know, you would never see Windex or anything like that in our house because my mom was very like adverse to chemicals. And then, you know, I dabbled with, you know, smoking cannabis when I was, you know, in, in high school and in college. And then when I decided to actually get into the industry, I hadn't consumed at all. I just looked at it as a natural way to medicate. Um, my father's diabetic, not that diabetes is on like the qualified medical condition. So I just looked at it from, okay, if a sick person could have access to one more option, isn't that a good thing? And then I wore the badge forever where I was like, nope, I'm the cannabis consultant that doesn't consume. And when we were legalizing like Midwest East Coast, that was literally a question that people would ask, which is like so invasive and so private. But a lot of the hedge funds on the East Coast, if I wanted to play with them, they liked to hear that I didn't consume. At that time, I didn't consume. Um, and then my journey with cannabis personally is I was hit, hit by a car, like not severely, I didn't like, you know, end up in the hospital or anything, but my back was out of whack. And at the time I was going through litigation and it was just something that one of my colleagues said, like, Hey, you know, you're drinking a bottle of wine at night to like de-stress, like try cannabis, you're in the industry. And I was like, Oh, okay. I should try that. Like <laughs> light bulb moment. Right. And I'm telling all these other people in my mind, I wasn't like sick. Right. I was just stressed. Um, mm -hmm. And in a little bit of pain. And that really changed my life. It changed my relationship with 
health, wellness, um, my relationship with uh, like weight loss and weight management, um, with stress, uh, with yoga, um, with how I do business and just how much I appreciate the plant. So I was having a conversation with the founder of Christian Cannabis and this is a new brand that's launching and they're looking to launch in multiple states simultaneously. But he was talking about how when he discovered that cannabis helped him, first of all, he was like smoking it late at night and just like, am I high? Am I, you know, connecting? What's what's happening? And for him to be somebody that, you know, had just never tried it until he's in his 30s and then to right. see how all of these parts of his life started blossoming because of that relationship with cannabis. So, you know, it's like it doesn't matter how long it takes somebody to finally meet and and have that relationship with mama cannabis, but when they do, it really is profound. Absolutely. And, you know, now it's like, obviously, I, I talk freely about it, you know, five years ago in the industry, that wasn't necessarily like the best thing to do. And I can remember one of my East Coast clients were like, well, we don't want to, they owned a facility and they're like, we don't want to be like them. And I'm like, like what? Like, educate me on what them is, you mm-hmm. know? And I found it so offensive. And I was like, listen, if you're categorizing people as them, that's me. And that's offensive. And I can tell you that I consume cannabis and I'm not a degenerate. I actually won you guys your license and you wouldn't have it if it wasn't for me. But that was the first time that I got like really so upset about the old school mentality of cannabis. And those were, there were like 20 investors on the line. And I was just like, I gave it to them. And, you know, most of the people kind of chimed in and was like, hey, so sorry. Like we didn't think of it like that. And we, we know we need to educate ourselves more. Um, Mm -hmm. And that company ended up to be, you know, wildly successful and they definitely take, took the advice, but it was new to the state. And a lot of times when it's new to the state, it's, it's this um, taboo thing that people think is, you know, gross or dirty or bad. And it's like, no, 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 no. Educate yourself on it. Then come to me with your opinion. If you're still not into it, then totally fine, but you have to educate yourself on it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the important things as women in the industry, you know, when we seem to be the ones that get those sorts of things first, you know, it's not just dollars and cents and black and white for us where we're compartmentalizing everything. It's like we're connecting all the dots simultaneously. So, you know, it's important to hone that confidence so you can be the one that stops the call and says, "Uh uh-uh, that's not how this is supposed to go. (laughs) And and it was funny because, you know, three years earlier when they had engaged me, I hadn't consumed. So like they were one of the people that were like, do you consume? And at that point it was a no. And then it was like, okay, if you really want to learn more about like my personal journey with cannabis, let's talk offline. Um, But I know it was like an eye-opening moment for them. And I, In those situations, I've learned not to judge because it's not a situation from usually it's not like ego or anything like that. It's it's just either misinformation or lack of information. So I'm always happy to, you know, help kind of, you know, get them through that. Yeah. And I think that's a good point because, you know, you can't be mad at someone for ignorance if, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And it's I mean, what, you can, but <laughs> well, it's not gonna. It's and I not often do. You. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, it's how they act and react after knowing that information. Are they yeah. still calling their clients thems and designing a, a storefront that you know treats us like we're criminals going into a shop? You know that that's the one thing I look forward to seeing change. This is a total tangent, but. You know, there are a few dispensaries where I live here in Northern California where I go in and I might as well be having a little boutique shopping experience. I've got a little basket. I can walk around, pick things up, smell things, do what I want. And then you go into other cities or other states and everything's behind glass, behind a counter. You know, you have to take a picture of what you want, tell them at the counter or even worse, they follow you around with an iPad and right. just do your shopping for you. So, you know, I like the idea of us kind of feminizing the shopping experience and making it more fun and social for people. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mean, obviously based on the state's regulations, when I design a store for a client, a lot of times in the dry states that are transitioning to medical, it's better for the user experience to have a more controlled experience because if you throw them into some of the open floor plans, it's a lot of times too overwhelming. Like they have no baseline. They don't know where to start. Um, they're wandering to the edibles and then their shopping experience doesn't become, you know, a positive thing. It becomes something that's like really overwhelming. Um, I can see you know, that. I yeah. can totally see that. Cause I'm the person that's been doing this for 20 years and I'm right. like, leave me alone. I know what I want. Totally. But totally. yes, a personal shopping experience is nice when you're a newbie. Right. And like, we'll do, you know, the patient, you know, rooms and so that they can go in behind closed doors. And, you know, even here in Arizona, I mean, we are a mature market and, you know, some of the people I know are not comfortable going into a store. And like, that's just kind of the reality of it. So depending on where you're opening your facility, you really have to have like a meeting of the minds. And I think a lot of my success and a lot of the projects that I've done is really localizing that experience. You know, California, and cannabis are like hand in hand. I mean, they go simultaneously together. Like, you know, it's like basically where the industry was born. Right. So, you know, you guys are, are ahead of the time in the sense that like cannabis is part of your culture in mm -hmm. other States. It's not part of the culture and it's foreign and it can be really scary. So it's a matter of really getting the customers or patients into an experience that's comfortable for them. That's, that's typically how I design my stores. Yeah. I appreciate that. The business that you have now, you offer consulting services of all kinds, but prior to that, you, you did actually run a cannabis operation, correct? You're the CEO of a cannabis company. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my journey basically was I bought a cannabis consulting company from the founder of the company I think back in like 2014, I built it. I sold it in 2018. And that was a consulting firm similar to the firm that I have today in the sense that we would help people um, secure licenses and then open their operations. I kind of had like, you know, a moment where I was like, you know, how do I build this? How do I scale this? How do I become a target? Especially since a lot of money was coming into the industry. I thought that if I didn't go corporate, I would just get like, you know, drowned it out. Um, and so I met with a group and in order to help facilitate their um, expansion plans, they decided to purchase my company. And then I became the CEO of that company. So it was a publicly traded cannabis company. And I was there for, I think, over a year. Um, and then my priorities just definitely changed after I had my son. I couldn't really anticipate what that all looked like as far as like motherhood so different for everybody. And you don't really know until like you have the baby. Um, and running a, a, a large conglomerate just wasn't going to be something that I could do <laughs> anymore because yeah. I didn't want to leave my son. <laughs> um, so I took some time off and I had a non-compete while I took time off. Um, and then just really like I ran my other facilities because I also own licenses um, and helped, you know, kind of get them squared away. So I didn't like leave, leave the industry. I still like was working on a day to day. I just didn't have like as big of a day-to-day -day role or task in the industry as I had. And then once my non-compete expired, um, that was really a matter of having a conversation with myself to say, you know, do you still love this? Do you still want to be a part of it? Would it still feel good to you um, to help legalize more states or more countries? And then in essence, get other people involved in the industry, you know, that have the financial wherewithal to potentially be in the industry. So that's where we are now. I think that's important that stepping back taking a moment to refresh and re-seek counsel from your higher self. Like, okay, is this still what I want to do? And, you know, how am I going to evolve my work-life balance now? I was talking to someone earlier who I'm just like, you know, it sounds to me like you need to be doing a little bit more breathing, a little bit of stretching. And he was just like, my alarm went off at 4 a.m. I had this, 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 and this. I've done all these things. And I'm like, okay, well, then now would be a good time to do some breathing, some stretching. Oftentimes that male mind, it's just task, task oriented. And it's just like, as women, we see this. 
and we see ourselves not necessarily getting the seat at the table or not getting paid as much. And we're like, well, shit, do I have to now be like that? Do I need to just work my tits off all the time to right. be like that? Honestly, and it, it still gets in my head because like, you know, prior to having children, I could hop on a flight tomorrow or I could go on a flight right now and go to New York or wherever I needed to go for the meeting the next day. And I don't have that flexibility anymore now that I have children. And so it definitely creeps into my mind at least once or twice a day. It is hard to get back into the workforce and it is hard to manage all the things that women need to manage. Um, And it is such a different dynamic for me in the sense that you have less downtime, you have less time um, and all of those things. And so like my heart definitely goes out to women, especially that are in like, you know, the workforce and then take a couple of years off for their family. And then they try and get back into the workforce and maybe they weren't an entrepreneur before, um, you know, maybe they were, you know, director level or even just entry level. And, you know, it is this really like strange conversation that you have to have with yourself where you have to be your biggest cheerleader. Nobody else is going to be like, nope, you're still relevant. You're still sharp. You're still smart after you have your kids. Um, And that's been like, like just basically a constant for me since I had my children. Now I love my children. They're my greatest accomplishment. And so it's this, um, you know, everybody says that once you become a mom, it's like mom guilt. It's just, it's real. It's real. And you're like, what does that mean? And then you have a kid and you're like, oh, I get it. Should I take the five o'clock meeting or should I feed my kids dinner? Should I jump on the flight and go to New York and get a different business opportunity? Or should I go to the birthday party this weekend with my children? It is a a strange thing, but it, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm curious what advice you have for people who are trying to navigate this. And, you know, it's like you have to be in the room for people to be considering you for something. So whether or not that room is going to the conference or going to the retreat or, you know, doing the podcast or or doing way too much fucking social media to keep your account relevant. What are those things? How do you talk to yourself? And and what are those kinds of maybe small things that you do to be in the room without wasting a bunch of fucking time? Right. Honestly, I was very lucky because I had pretty much both of my kids in like their young, young, young years during the pandemic. So the world changed for me. (laughs) Not exactly for me, but that's how it felt, right? Where I was like, okay, I used to be speaking at all these things. I used to be on a million flights. And so the pandemic like really did some favors for me from a work perspective, because I think people just got way smarter on how they manage their time, what meetings are remote, what meetings are in person. Um, While I'm glad events are coming back and stuff like that, you know, some tips that, you know, I use for myself um, just to keep super organized are like, you can't have enough project management tools, you know, utilize your calendar. I now calendar if I have to send a contract out for 15 minutes, which sounds crazy. Um, But I have like other things on my brain now where I didn't have those before, like family responsibilities. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just a different like mindset because, you know, the family responsibilities of unfortunately in the way that our brains are rewired come first. It's just how your body naturally evolves after you have children. So I have to do things like that um, just to keep myself on task. And then I got really good at saying no. And I got really good at setting boundaries when I was super broke in the industry, I also had that ability where it's like, you know, it takes me more than $10,000 to get out of bed. And so, you know, there's only so much free or complimentary work you can do with somebody um, until you have to put that boundary up and say, hey, like, I can't want this more than you want this. Um, And so in that situation, there has to be like monetary compensation for it. I say, you know, hyper focus on what your goal in the industry is because you're not going to be good at everything. So if you want to do 10 things, do three. Now I have to ask you another question. How do you respond to the people that want to pick your brain? No. Because I, <laughs> I'm i like, if one more person asks to pick my brain, I'm going to poke somebody's eyeballs out. Pay me for what I do and what I offer. I get asked to for the brain picking all the time. So what do you do? How do you get over that hump? 
So honestly, I, I'm open about picking my brain as like my one of my least favorite terms. And it's because I'm a consultant and I get paid for my time and my time is my most valuable, you know, thing, yeah, so, right? Yeah. So for me, I set my rate high and I'm 550 an hour. And that just basically like weeds people out that wouldn't necessarily like be able to understand paying that. Um, and then I make my decision from there. Like before I used to be like psycho and I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, here's the link and, you know, pay me. If it's a project I want to get on, I'll get on the phone without payment. And then sometimes I'll just be like, you know what, forget about payment. I know we're going to work together or I'll credit that back to their contract or their retainer. Um, but we actually are putting together a couple tools on one of my websites that's you know, most people want to pick your brain because they want to get into the industry. So like if you and I had a dollar for every time somebody was like, how do I get into the industry? Like we'd be very, very, very wealthy, mm -hmm. right? So we put a tool on the, one of our new websites that basically takes people through the journey and matches like their skill set and their financial contribution with either an employee, plant touching business, ancillary business or investor. And so that tool was literally created for what you just said. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. go to the website, take the quiz, and then download the white paper. Once you read the white paper about your category, if you want to make an investment, if you want to get into plant touching, if you want to get into ancillary, let us know and we'd be more than happy to help. But at least it provides them with like information and tools to potentially take the bull by the horns and do something for themselves prior to being like, hey, hey. Can you do things for me for free? It's like, no, I cannot. Yeah. Well, and, you know, since we kind of sit on opposite sides of the industry, I'm, you know, more consumer facing. And so mine is random people. My mother-in-law, you know, just found out she has cancer. What do I need to do? And so then I'm just like, well, shit, this is a difficult time in someone's life. But like to just ask me that question there's a thousand things you need to do. And it's going to take me a long time to like put together a plan for you. Where do you live? Like what, you know, there's so many yeah. variables to something like that. It's not simple. And I'm like, that's why I have an hour consulting session, like pay me and I'd be happy to do it. But it's always based around somebody being sick. And I'm like, Ugh! and so I just do it. So we just thought of a brilliant idea. <laughs> Because <laughs> how do you take what's in your brain and systemize it and automate it, autom make it automatic, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's something that I've always been so interested in, in my career because when it was just me and I was running the show and I was doing the marketing and paying the bills and doing all the things that business owners do, how do you take what's in your brain and get it out there so that the masses can enjoy it? And you can reap the benefits of it by touching thousands of people where before you could only touch, you know, dozen or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, which obviously automation doesn't ever take away like human capital, in my opinion. However, it is scary and there needs to be some sort of a starting point for people. And I understand where you would have that conversation with yourself where you're like, oh, my gosh, they have cancer. They're sick. They're dying. Like, I have to help this person. I don't know. Are there like dispensaries in your area that have like patient care coordinators? Yes, there's stuff like that that are in, you know, a lot of dispensaries are starting to do that. I created a cannabis class resource guide and Be Well flashcards that talk about all these things. I'm like, you can purchase this on my website. See, that's <laughs> or, perfect. you know, there's there, th things do exist. I did think about these things, but you know, it's just like, the people in your life that just are like, hey, we went to college together. I haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah, so. totally. I will tell you, Facebook leads are the worst leads. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to say, we never close a deal off social media. Now we have a couple. Um, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. The DMs can get hairy sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> So um, what other advice do you have for women so that we don't have to lean on the I'm a woman, poor me crutch in the cannabis space? Yes, you and I definitely share that same um, idea. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You know, I think that if you want to be in the industry, you you have to take your seat at the table and you have to like 
refine your tools and you have to have, you know, a reason to be there, whether that's, you know, a skill set that you have or something that you're going to learn, you know, and I think that being overprepared is super important where if you're going to go into a meeting or if you're going to, you know, potentially get a job interview or something like that, like know about the industry. I mean, there's, you can Google the industry today. You didn't used to be able to Google the industry when we were writing our business plans back in the day, especially like for here in Arizona, if you Googled cannabis strains, like nothing came up. So right now, (laughs) like there are, there's been millions, if not billions of dollars spent on online resources for our industry. Um, You know, our website's one of them where it talks about, you know, cannabis legalization and what's going on in every single state. Um, And if you are serious about being in the industry, whether that's from, you know, a business perspective or a patient perspective or an employee perspective, you know, do do your research. There's so much out there on the Internet now that you can at least understand what your state landscapes are, you know, like what's available in the state that you live in, what's not available. And from there, you can formulate your plan. Yeah, and I I think. Another thing, too, is just getting really involved in your local community, showing up at your local events and mixers. And, you know, I heard you on another show talking about being young and in the industry and having to nip in the bud really quickly. I'm interested in doing business with you, not dating you. And you kind of getting bossy and sitting at the head of a table and telling other people where to sit and leading conversations. And there is something about a bossy woman that men do love and appreciate. And they will follow you if you do it gracefully. Right. And I think like the art of the deal is a big thing for women too. Like I love the art of the deal. I do. I love the negotiation piece. I love being able to say no if I don't want to do it. I love being able to say yes if I do want to do it. And, you know, a lot of the women that I work with, because I love mentoring women and I love like, you know, looking at women's business plans or pitch decks or just even hearing their concept to be like, okay, I like it or I don't or tweak this or whatever you need kind of a thing. And those are some of the things that I do complimentary for sure. But asking for money is something that women are not traditionally good at. And so the better you can get at knowing how much you're worth on an hourly basis and asking for that money and being comfortable with asking for that money with the appropriate bank account set up and contracts and all of the things that we know you need for a business. I think that that's really, really, really powerful for women. And in my work with women, that's one of the things that they lack the most. Yeah. And I struggle with that too. I'll admit it. I grew up with four sisters. Yeah. Four sisters on a ranch. My dad worked us like men and taught us to not need anybody to take care of us, to, you know, be strong, independent women. And then now it's like asking for help is like, you know, kryptonite to Superman. Like, why is it so hard to ask for help? It's silly, but I think a lot of women struggle with that. Yeah. I don't know. I was so You're like, I don't. So I I didn't because I had, this has been in like all of my interviews, but I had dinner with this guy and like from an investment standpoint, and there was like a group of us and he like kind of said to me under his breath, he's like, well, you'll never sell your company because it's not scalable. It's just you. So at that moment I got, you know, into the mindset where it's like, how do I scale this? How do I make the business not me? And so if you have a business that you don't want to be you, you have to empower other people. Um, plus I've always liked my free time. Like I love traveling and, you know, back in the day, the industry was somewhat seasonal so I could take off and I could go see the world. Um, and so I, I will say I am decent at asking for help. (laughs) And, and I think for me, most of the time it's financial help asking, you know, for, for help in another way. Yeah, I get it. Like I, I have to have help to get this show out the door. But yes, I did have someone once say that they wanted to invest in my business. But if I were to get hit by a bus, where would their investment be? And I'm like, I got you. I got you. I get it. I'm still trying to figure out what I want this to be for me before I get other people on board with it. So, you know, I was just kind of being in the flow, figuring out what was going to work for me at the time. But that definitely... 
that registered. And I'm like, I hear yeah. you. So if I ever want to do this, I, I know what I need to do. Well, it's like a stool, right? So one yeah. of the legs of the stool, whether the stool has three or four legs, <laughs> can be you. But the rest cannot be you. <laughs> yeah, totally. So yeah, you're good at reinventing your business model. Um, you've done that quite a bit going through. And the word pivot is something that gets thrown around, but it's the fucking truth. You have to be able to pivot at a moment's notice to stay relevant in this industry. So, you know, what kind of advice do you have or maybe a story that you have around around that? I think it's like my middle name. I don't know. I mean, I even went and got salads before this for the team and I made two and the direction was make two the same. I don't know how to do that, right? So there's part of me that's like your ultimate, like creative or creator, um, where I I like to pivot. I like to innovate. I like to look at things from a fresh lens and create something new and exciting that that hasn't existed in the industry. And so sometimes that's worked for my benefit, and sometimes it hasn't. Um, but from like a business standpoint, you know, that's how I've basically pivoted is, you know, to go back in myself and, and reinvent and recreate whatever version we're launching at that moment. Right. And that goes into like a lot of our RFP work where re request for proposal request for application. I mean, if I tried to use a Colorado bid for Maryland, it wouldn't work because it wasn't hyper local to the area. So for me, those are some like business themes. And then from a pivot standpoint of like you personally in the industry, if you can't roll, you can't be in the industry. I mean, honestly, like I think I was just so young and I didn't know any different. And every time I tried to hire somebody that was like smarter than me or had better credentials than I did, where I was like, oh, maybe if I hired like a CEO to run the company, it never worked well because they had old corporate mentality that they tried to bring to the table. And then they would present me with like this grand plan for how to do something. And I'm like, you can't do it that way. It's the cannabis industry. There's, you can't do AdWords. You can't do interstate commerce. Like there's all these things that you can't even sometimes open a bank account. So, yeah. you know, for me, my reality was always this. And that's, I think another reason why I've stuck in the industry is because like, where do you go after this? Where it's like, you have fires to put out all day, every day. And working on your core business isn't necessarily what we all do. It's, it's pivot, yeah. put a fire out. <laughs> and, and from a place that wouldn't normally be, you know, a normal business is activity that they had to do. Yeah. Um, right before I had my son, it was like, Wells Fargo was like, we are shutting all your cannabis accounts down. And I'm like, I don't have plant touching accounts with Wells Fargo. They don't care. So guess what? Yeah. It takes you a hundred hours to reset everything up, interview what bank you can go to. And until you're in the cannabis industry, you don't know that pain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, when I told somebody that it took me eight months to find a merchant services company that would do my processing, they have no idea how many hours it took me to do something that would take a normal person 45 minutes. A hundred percent. Yeah, We just went through that again. We had um, part of the business that I sold was a Shopify store and Shopify has like a weird policy on cannabis, but I think it's th that my store at the time was like a high volume store. So it was kind of like, don't ask, don't tell. Since then, we've launched another Shopify store that wasn't doing any revenue. And they were like, just kidding, you cannot be involved, right? So it's like, you know, even when you get your like workaround or whatever, and then you think it could potentially work again, it won't. So the payment processing that we just set up, I guarantee it took about six months. And it was so frustrating because I'm like, I had a store, I sold a store, we were processing payments, nobody ever flagged our account. Why can I not just get a credit card processor so I can get information on the industry out to the masses? And it's like, nope, too bad. Yeah, this is exactly why I had problems because I was launching a new hemp CBD muscle rub. And, it, you know, you have barely any sales. You're just starting out. And yeah, yeah it's just like scrutinized constantly. And it's been a nightmare. But I recently canceled my QuickBooks account for both of my companies because they were flagging me for 
submitting invoices, for advertising campaigns, for this. I'm like, I'm not even touching the plate. I'm just talking about it. And well, the they, banks would even say to me, they were like, well, we Googled your name. I'm like, yeah. And if you Google my name at that time, I didn't have like active plant touching businesses. I'm like, we're like government relations. We're, we're consulting. They don't care because they don't understand yeah. it. So it's like the same thing that we were talking about in the beginning of the conversation where it's like, if you don't understand something, it's too scary and you just don't have the mind space for it. Yeah. And QuickBooks, I'm saying to them as they're calling me, telling me they're auditing my websites and stuff. I'm just like, you're my bookkeeper. Why is this any it's of your $43 business? a month. Like, give me a break. <laughs> and <laughs> you know then I mean? they're like, well, we're owned by Intuit. And Intuit, the bank that funds Intuit, isn't a fan of CBD. And so now, you know, my bookkeeper has found a different way for us to manage my books so that I can just shut that shit down because they actually are 80 bucks a month for each account. And I'm like, I can't even oh, use yeah. all your services. Right. So yeah, it's, it's so frustrating. Totally. Any advice that you have for, you know, navigating cannabis without a playbook that we need to know any resources that you want to push people to? Yeah. So how to open a dispensary is that quiz that I was telling you about where like, basically I wanted to create a website for the masses so they could go to the website and say, how do I get involved kind of a thing. And so okay. the quiz is on the front page and it basically gets you into, you know, uh, an employee status, plant touching business status, ancillary status and or investor status, and then gives you the white paper of information of how you could potentially get involved. Okay. Um, and then on the like real meat and potatoes of that website is we're starting to put a lot of our secret sauce for how to open dispensaries from an application and operation standpoint online. A lot of the new states are going into like a lottery type system. And so what that means is you don't have to put all the paperwork together prior to being approved. Um, and so people are getting licenses and have no idea what to do. So mm -hmm. at that point, you know, we put the you know ball in their court where it's like, okay, download, you know, what you need to download and basically become more like any normal industry where you can download a business in the box, standard operating procedures, marketing templates, um, promotions, uh, corporate structure, documentation, operating agreements. Um, and so we've, we've changed things a bit for some of the pieces where it's more like a course and it teaches you how to do it. Um, and then some of the things are just a la carte where you can just grab, you know, one SOP here, one SOP there kind of a thing. So what states do you think are the most friendly for entrepreneurs trying to enter the space? Uh, New York and New Jersey right now are potentially going to be unlimited licensed markets. And so some people like that. And what I warn clients about is, yes, it, it's a good thing, but it can also be a very bad thing in the sense that the limited license markets where there's 150 licenses available, quite frankly, Supply those people demand. don't have to be as business savvy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're opening in a jurisdiction that's giving away 10 dispensaries and the population's only 100,000, guess what? You better believe you get creative. You better believe you have the best product in town. So, um, you know, I don't know what that means for the industry just because we don't have more free markets than we do limited license markets. Um, but it's definitely like the new tone for cannabis. Mm -hmm. I don't envision, you know, the southern states playing that game. Um, but a lot of the East Coast states that want to be like more inc inclusive, um, that's kind of like the programming that they're deciding on. That sounds a lot like um, Oklahoma. I was shocked to find out that there are like 7,000 dispensaries in the state of Oklahoma, and we have less than 800 here in California. Yeah. So depending on your opinion of the industry, that's like not a good thing. Right. I'm um, just like, what? That's insane. Well, they've like floated a moratorium where you can't like basically open more, um, but it's also become a hotbed for all of the things. <laughs> so Oklahoma yeah, has so, become uh, one of the biggest, you know, suppliers of illegal cannabis in the United States, which we know California is much larger, much more population um, and much older to the game than Oklahoma. Um, I think that there's a lot of like 
foreign capital that maybe illegally runs through the state. So um, anytime I get in front of legislators, that is not my preferred methodology. And it's not because I'm a capitalist. It's because it creates a lot of problems. Um, yeah. You know, it's still a schedule one drug and it still needs to be handled in a way that is compliant. And once you get over, you know, thousands of facilities, you don't have the manpower as an agency to visit those facilities to make sure that their books are clean, to make sure that their seed to sale is actually going where it says, and all of the things that we know can kind of go uh, berserk in the industry. Yeah. You know, that's one thing that I always think you know, pragmatically when policies get in place, I'm like, okay, well, do they have the funds yet to enforce the rules? And that helps me decide what I'm going to do because, you know, you can't hire enough people to check on 7,000 dispensaries. Well, in like one of the States that I have a license in, it's like, they have pretty much like one person in charge and just for on all fronts, that's not a good thing, right? Because, you know, that person could not have the right ideas or relationship with the licensee and they could, you know, potentially make that person's life more difficult, right? So, you know, the states that do it right, I think they put their commission together and they try and like hit on the different topics, you know, compliance and, you know, patient and agriculture or taxation, um, you know, and that to me is like probably the most solid approach. Um, but you're right that that's why, you know, people always complain about the fees that it takes to like submit an application, but that's what jumpstarts the program and allows for them to build a commission or a board or whatever that looks like. That's basically helping these people get their facilities open in a compliant way. I think some of the fees are like insane, but for the most part, I believe that these have to at least be 25000 so that the program gets up and running in a way that it can pay staff and it can, you know, make sure patient cards are getting through and it makes sure that facilities are actually opening. Yeah. So which state do you think you would consider like the model for the industry that you know, is the best one to build from? You know, I think that all the states have good ingredients. And a lot of times we see the regions play similarly, which I think is a benefit. I don't think that there's like a one size fits all approach to cannabis at this stage in the game, in the sense that now we have 40 some odd states doing their own thing. And that's one reason that federal legalization, you know, terrifies me. Because yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, you saw what happened in California. So I always use the example of California mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, California was like rogue, right? So every single municipality was doing their own thing. And then the state said, hey, we need to get in on this revenue, which rightfully so, understood. But then they put these rules and regulations together that when they laid them over the municipality rules and regulations, it didn't work. It didn't fit. The regulations were contradicting each other. Their fees were too high. And now they're having to redo it. I've seen, you know, some legislation that's coming now that they're having to basically redo it. So for me, federal legalization is a scary thing if they don't incorporate each state's unique playbook, as you say, and, and really try and leave that piece alone. And then maybe just, you know, declassify or get us some banking access. And I think that there's things that the federal government can do. But I think a big piece of the success in that is ensuring that whatever programming has been built on the state level stays somewhat consistent. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not the only one that doesn't necessarily trust our federal government to do the right thing. I think less people than uh, ever in the last couple of years do. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And, you know, it's funny how we talk about navigating cannabis from the business sense where we're like, you know, we're all doing the best we can with all the information that we have. And, you know, the consumers are doing the same thing. So it's like as we're as an industry doing this, making sure that the people that are in charge are ultimately thinking about that end consumer that's going to be purchasing the cannabis for their wellness or adult use reasons. And it just doesn't feel like the trajectory of where we're going. It's, it's not about that. You know, the majority of the people, it is big money. It is, 
um, other large industries trying to come in and just eat up the cannabis industry and turn it into another one of the monsters that they have. And so it's like, you know, I get concerned about the federal legalization piece where it's like, I need this industry to maintain some sort of soul and perspective. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we're at a point, if it were to be federally legalized, I feel like the heart and soul of cannabis would die. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's why like each local piece of the industry is so, so, so important because even in the big industries, there's still local farmers, there's still local breweries, there's still local companies that are craft that, you know, really tailor to their audience that's local to them. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever like I've never really operated from like a scarcity perspective or like a fear mongering perspective where I'm like, oh, my God, the big pharma is going to come in and completely buy up our industry. Um, and I don't know if that's like my spirituality or I've just been around the block enough in cannabis that I just don't feel like that would happen. Um, I think that if it was going to happen, it would have already happened. Um, I mean, I feel like it's, it is happening a little bit, but I appreciate, sure. I appreciate your perspective and being hopeful and we all should not operate from a place of fear and scarcity. Ladies, right. Well, did you I hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Right. And it one more time for the people in bed. Yes, right. um, no. And like, I mean, it's, it's definitely changed the industry. Like I'm not ignorant to the fact that like here in Arizona, there used to be like, everybody was independent. Everybody was local. And now it's like to find a local operator is like a diamond in the rough. So it, it's, it's definitely going away from that, but there's always going to be like opportunities for entrepreneurs, whether that's from like an ancillary place, you know, a product line, a small grow. Now we're seeing social equity is a thing or minority based cannabis companies. And so the states are doing a good job of like carving out, you know, certain parameters for people to be able to get involved um, from a small business lens or a small business perspective. Um, you know, there's so many like hit pieces in the media, especially with like how Illinois went down and, oh, it's, you know, a, a show and it's all the MSOs behind some of these local people. And like, I get that lens, but I also get the lens of like, if you give a social equity applicant a vertical license in a state, that's a $20 million ask conservatively. So at what point, are they going to have to call on big cannabis or big investors? They're going to have to, right? Otherwise, they're yeah. going to lose this asset that they have. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing in New York, they're actually like pairing the social equity candidates with some sort of funding, which has been like my talking piece in the industry for the last five years, where it's like, if you're going to do this, you have to set these people up for success. Yes. Um, and, you know, and I think that speaks to something you talk about, about brokering relationships. And so, you know, it's like dropping the ego. Okay. I'm, I need help. Who are the strategic partners that we can pull together to make something like this happen? And, you know, these small equity businesses deserve somebody to help them put together that strategic team. Right. And on the flip side of it, I mean, I've worked with a lot of startup women companies and a lot of social equity companies, like there has to be some sort of like a teaching and a training for them too. Because a lot of times when you first match a social equity candidate or a small business candidate with like funding, it's worlds apart. It's like, you know, their business is worth a hundred thousand. It's like, you haven't even done anything with your business yet. It's not worth a hundred thousand. So, you know, it is a really hard relationship to merge or manage in the sense it's like activists or social equity mentality, you know, m merging them with big business is, is a hard thing to do. Um, and so it, it takes, a very special person to be able to finesse both sides so that the big money people can see, you know, the activist lens or the social equity lens and the social equity lens can see, you know, the, the big cannabis or big money type investor side. Yeah. Um, well, but it's it is also, difficult. <laughs> yeah. And it's also offering them something that's better than a payday loan. Cause that's what some of these social equity programs it's like, we're giving you this money, but you immediately have to start paying it back. And it's like, okay, I, you're not giving us time to grind and get it done. 
I think the best deals that I see are if there's not capital already available for like the social equity candidate, you know, is giving them a healthy role in the facility with a great salary, um, dividends, and then, you know, some sort of buyout opportunity eventually so that they can pass the legacy or the the monetary value of the legacy to their family. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like those deals. I think that they're fair deals, um, you know, in the sense that some of the social equity candidates like want out. They're like, all right, I'm going to make my millions here and then I'm bouncing. That's totally cool, right? But mm-hmm. there are a lot of them that want the experience of potentially working with somebody that is more sophisticated and savvy in business yeah. than they are, like a shark take type situation. So, Certainly. you know, every personality type's different. Um, but I don't like to be a part of deals that are, you know, the the sleazy, like get out of my business type of a thing, unless that's what the candidate wants in the sense that it's like, I just want out. Okay, cool. You know, yeah. Um, any deal I'm a part of, or I try negotiating for clients or, or um, you know, partners is I, I like it to try and be, you know, somewhat fair where each side is giving a little bit. Yeah. It's the definition of negotiating. Everybody needs yeah. to feel like they're, yeah, everybody, everybody might feels that like they're nego- giving, they got to, yes. everybody's got to feel like they've put a little skin in the game. They're getting a little something back. Sometimes it's- that definition needs to be floated around a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think is important to finish up with? No, I enjoyed the conversation. I think it's um, important to kind of not only sharpen your tools, but, you know, maintain and and try and keep a positive attitude and and getting into this, um, you know, crazy industry that we all know and love. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I, you know, like I said, I sit on another side of it. I talk to CEOs, business owners about what they're doing and about what they're bringing in. But it's not very often that I get to talk to somebody that's got their hands in all of the pots. And so it was nice to get your perspective today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. And thank you all for hanging out. With all this talk about pivoting, I got to thinking about my days as a basketball player. I began playing ball and going to basketball camp around eight years old. My favorite camp counselor, she called me Pee Wee. Because I was so much smaller than the other kids. And because of that, I quickly learned three lessons that have served me on and off the court ever since. Number one, I learned the value of keeping my head up. You don't miss opportunities when you're looking for them. Number two, The importance of pivoting to find the open lane when I'm covered up. Remember that pivoting, be it in your life, relationships, or business, it is not a defeat or failure. I rather think it's something to celebrate because it showcases your ability to acknowledge and adapt in real time to create the life, love, and career you want. And number three, If I'm wide open to score and my teammate can't see me, it helps to get loud and make my presence known. Now, I hope this podcast inspires you to get out there and do the exact same thing. And if you identify with me and this show because you feel called to service by plant medicine, perhaps the quiz Sarah referenced during our chat is a good place to start. I'll include more information in the podcast 222 show notes at casuallybaked.com. While you're there, check out the latest offers from Casually Baked partner brands like Dr. Fossum's Pet Care, where you save 20% using promo code casuallybaked20. From sleek and functional glass by Session Goods to quality CBD supplements by Aspen Green, to the MJ Relief Muscle Rub, I never leave home without. Shopping podcast affiliates is a win-win because you save money on the things you want and that supports the production of this show. As always, email your requests or can of curious questions through the website or DM me on social. I'm at Casually Baked on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and the WeedTube. However you decide to support our highly responsible cannabis movement, thank you for doing your part to Puff Puff Pass It On. 
Casually Baked the Podcast was created, recorded, and produced by yours truly. Editing and sound design are in the capable hands of Jamie Humiston at PodConnects. The podcast theme music is by my highly talented friend, Seth Walker. If you aren't familiar with Seth's music, you can find High Time on his album, Gotta Get Back, wherever you're buying your music these days. I know he didn't create High Time for me, but it sure as shit sounds like he did, right? I hope you'll tune in next time. Thanks for hanging out. Hi, my name's Kate, and I'm your host of the Pop Moms Podcast. I started the Pop Moms Podcast, well, because I wanted to end the stigma against using cannabis, specifically with moms, but also anyone who chooses to consume. I strive for a balance of humor and education, along with some pretty rad guests, to help combat social biases that come with consuming cannabis. Kids are hard. Join me for regular podcast episodes packed with parenting hacks, real life stories, and of course, my favorite cannabis products. The days are long, but the years are short. So roll another J and take a deep breath. Keep blazing and stay amazing.